Right, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for being um, punctual. Um, this second session is, in the first session, we were looking at um, the report and the issues of big principle, um, freedom of expression, privacy, and how they um, relate to um, competing rights on security and elsewhere. What we're looking to do in this second session is to drill down um, country specific, but also to show where organizations that uh, are in some way involved with GNI and share our principles, how uh, one can make a difference or at least, at least highlight issues um, on the ground in specific um, countries. Um, it's great uh, to have the, the second panel with us. Um, I'm going to introduce them as um, they, uh, in the order in which they're going to make little three or four minute presentations of these um, specific case studies. Mike Newman from WebSense, um, Sarah Norbrand from the Church of Sweden, um, in what looks like my old office in London, Emily Butzler from Index on Censorship, and um, uh, Meg Rogensack um, from Human Rights First. Um, so thank you um, to them all, and um, over to you, Mike. Okay, so... Uh you know, the topic that I wanted to discuss today um, related to, uh, or the example related to our company and uh, a situation that took place in Pakistan a few months ago. For those of you who aren't familiar with WebSense or what we do, we're certainly not the same scale of uh, some of the original company members of GNI. Uh, we are a leading uh, web security, email security, and data security company, and uh, one of the products we provide with web security is uh, uh, software products that help manage access to the internet. And uh, we sell these products principally to organizations to help them manage uh, how their employees use the internet in the workplace and to secure organizations from web-based threats. Uh, but one of the uh, topics that always comes up with the nature of our product is the ability of it to be used on a uh, national level uh, in terms of managing citizen access to the internet. And uh, as now, stepping into a larger topic, I mean, as everybody in this room probably is aware, there are obviously uh, uh, governments who either themselves or uh, through legal uh, requirement uh, insist that their local ISPs uh, manage or filter or censor in some way their citizens' access to the Internet. Now, uh, WebSense has for a long time had a policy that we won't engage in those sorts of products. We won't uh, engage in, in any projects that involve government uh, filtering of uh, the Internet except for certain things like child porn and, and things of that nature. Um, we had done so uh, on a fairly quiet basis. It was on our website and things. Um, but, uh, you know, we seven months ago joined GNI because we had hoped that years ago when we adopted this policy that other companies, our industry might follow suit, and they hadn't. And uh, we, we joined GNI to, to be more public about it, more vocal about it, and to hope uh, to work with GNI to help make uh, a difference in some of these situations. And then that leads me into the specific example that I wanted to cover, which was um, the government of Pakistan uh, wanted to uh, ensure that uh, its citizens' uh, access to the Internet was going to be filtered in some way, shape, or form. They didn't fully describe what content they wanted censored from the Internet, but they were looking for products to do so. Um, now, when I first became aware of it through GNI, um, I, I checked with our local sales team, and they, of course, had already been aware of this and had already uh, decided that we couldn't participate in it and weren't. And sort of in the old days of WebSense, that would have been the end of it. But uh, GNI, and, and then one of our many competitors simply would have bid on that project. Um, but in this uh, uh, heightened sense of awareness and, and through our involvement with GNI, particularly GNI more than us, was uh, able to contact uh, a number of other companies in our industry and used us as an example of a company that was very clearly on record as not going to bid on the project. And frankly, many of these Western companies in our space, some of which were, are very large companies that, that have multitudes of product beyond just ours, um, actually did uh, refuse to bid in this project. And these companies, uh, once contacted initially, were um, I think we're hesitant to say no and to say they wouldn't participate, but I think as the visibility and the pressure increased, they ultimately did say no. And these were uh, several of these companies absolutely would have participated in this bid, 
um, if not for in this project, if not for that pressure. And and so I think uh, our involvement and and us us you know you always have this prisoner's dilemma situation where you know nobody wants to be the first one to do something, and and because we'll, we'll, somebody else is just going to swoop in and take it. And so we've been sort of the the mover in this, saying okay, we're going to take this stand and be the first to say we won't do it. And I think GNI was able to leverage off of that to get others to say no. And uh, going forward, you know, as long as we can continue to uh, uh, increase the profile and visibility of these sorts of projects, I do believe that, uh, that some of the companies in our industry will continue, uh, in some respects, whether they like it or not, to, uh, to, to agree not to participate in those projects. Thank you. Sarah. Um, I represent the Churches Fund, and we are just as websites, we're a relatively new member of the g and um, We joined as an investor member last fall. Uh, what we didn't know then was that these topics would uh, be quite high up the agenda only a few months afterwards. Basically what happened in, in uh, mid-April was that there was uh, an investigative report on the Swedish television uh, about telecom operator Telia Sonora and its subsidiaries in, in Belarus and in countries in Central Asia. Um, and, um, and the dual use of, of the technologies um, provided. Um, clearly, if you look at Telia Sonora, it's a company who has clearly contributed to increased access to communications in the countries they are operating. At the same time, um, uh, the regimes are really um, misusing the te technologies which, which are leading to uh, severe monitoring and, and severe effects of, uh, of uh, journalists, union activists and so on. Um, I think it was a pretty good program but there were a lot of uh, unanswered questions afterwards and there still are questions such as um, what, sh what are actually the possibilities uh, for a company to, to push back on governments in these countries. Um, what are the possibilities to truly enhance positive impacts when you are operating in, in, uh, uh, in repressive regimes? And, and what are the possibilities to, to mitigate the negative impacts? Um, and also, not at least, um, to have the ability to engage also with local stakeholders around these issues, where I know that Meg is going to talk more about that later on. Um, but what happened was really very much that there has been an increasing pressure on the telecom sector in Europe. After this program, uh, a lot of investors have reacted um, and are pushing for action plans and so on, not only from this company, but from a lot of other European telecom com uh, operators and uh, networks providers. Um, what was, I think, particularly interesting also in this case, and, and which increased to, to the pressure, was the fact that uh, the Swedish state uh, is a major owner of uh, this company. It has a share of about 35 percent. So the, minist uh, the Minister of Financial Markets also intervened um, and demanded um, a robust and a credible work around freedom of expression and, and privacy. So if you add to that also the, the work of the European Commission right now when they are trying to translate the UN guiding principles to the ICT sector, uh, earlier the work of the Council of Europe was mentioned, we, can, we clearly see that, that, that the pressure is increasing. And of course, we are, we're looking for, um, as an investor, the, the companies that, that will do the most and that will actually um, design the most credible and, and, and useful work uh, within this space. Um, it will be very interesting, I think, to, to follow this part of the value chain uh, the coming month and, and, and the coming year uh, to see where it will end. Um, as you know, today we don't have a a telecom uh, member within the GNI, and I, I hope to see that. Um, what we do as an investor is still that we use the, GN the GNI and the GNI um, principles to benchmark companies, um, uh, to, uh, to benchmark ICT companies instead. So that it, to, to really stress that it is the standard that we think present best practice today, um, not at least the multi-stakeholder approach, but also the, the higher <coughs> level of transparency and, and the independent assessment. So yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, just first, um, Emily Budsalar in London. Just We had um, problems with the video link to Bangalore an hour or two ago with um, Sunil Abraham. So just first of all, um, 
can you just say hello or say a few things first of all? Hi, can you hear me? Is that a start? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you very well. Great. You can hear Hi, us as well. Good. Fire away. Hi, I'm Emily Butzler. I work for Index on Censorship here in London, uh, John's old pressure group. Uh, we look at free expression issues. Uh, we were already dealing with quite a few challenges to free expression and privacy in the UK. Uh, but today the government uh, released their draft communications data bill, uh, which Cindy Cohen, Premier Beth, who's here today, decided, described as a, a new low for Western democracy. So it's a win for us. Uh, it's going to require the details of internet use in the UK to be stored for a year to allow the police and intelligence service. It's a draft that's 117 pages long, so uh, I was asked to brief you on it, but uh, it's quite a lot to pack in for three hours, is how long it's been out. And we don't have data yet on the technology that's going to actually make it work. But the idea is this 1.8 billion program is designed to compel our poor ISPs to log communications data for every website visit, as well as access made to uh, customers' email accounts, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, peer-to-peer uh, -peer communications. Uh, we don't know how they're going to do it. The suggestion is it's going to be used via a black box. Uh, the government says it's actually going to include HTTPS encryption. We're not quite sure how but it's going to be the details of everything you send over the internet. Thank you. Yeah. Just um, Emily's first words uh, were um, a little bit uh, hard to discern. Emily, can you just um, repeat at the beginning um, <laughs> the jurisdiction we're talking about, which is the UK? I think some of uh, my old colleagues and your sorry, colleagues sorry. were talking loudly behind you, or um, there was feedback on, on the line. Okay. Well, the details that the government are looking to collect for 12 months include uh, messages sent by social media, webmail, web messaging, voice calls over the internet, uh, online gaming, email, phone records. The data that they're collecting or requiring third parties to collect is the time, the duration, the originator, the recipient, and the location. Uh, this information can be accessed without a warrant provided uh, a police officer or uh, one of the designated agencies specifies that they are investigating a crime or protecting national security. Now, the only thing it doesn't include is the content of the message. Officers still need a warrant to see that, but in reality, you know, is there a distinction here between content and traffic data? Is that distinction archaic? Is it irrelevant? Uh, what are the privacy risks going to be uh, as these databases become vulnerable to theft? Who's going to be responsible for the expense of storing and maintaining these databases? Who's basically going to be responsible if the information leaks? Uh, how, uh, how are they going to force, uh, how are they going to track Skype, Google, Facebook, Twitter? Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, the original intention was to fold all this information into our gigantic da database, but now individual uh, communication providers will be required, uh, required to, to track it. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. Uh, as ever, the um, technological gremlins um, have slightly intervened, but, but we, caught, um, we caught that. Um, Emily was talking about the UK Data Communications Bill that was formally um, announced um, today and what NGOs and specifically Index um, uh, working with GNI members um, are seeking to do to um, uh, tackle the worst elements um, of the proposed legislation. Thank you, Emily. We will come back to you uh, with uh, the question session. Um, Meg. I was asked to talk about uh, Russia's selective enforcement of anti-piracy laws to stifle dissent. Uh, we first became aware of this when an NGO partner that we worked very closely with uh, was raided and its leader was subject to criminal prosecution for allegedly using unlicensed Microsoft software. And um, we had an established relationship with Microsoft because we were both co-founders of the GNI, and that was extremely important because we had an open channel of communication, an established level of trust, and through the GNI, we also had a framework for thinking about the problem itself. What exactly was the problem, how to frame it, what would be some principles that we might use to solve it? Because on its face, although this is sort of the dry area of IP enforcement, it really, the broader uh, question is, 
what do companies do when operating in repressive environments? How do they avoid getting enmeshed in abusive enforcement? And what strategies can they adopt that protect not only their operations and their continued business presence, but also protect the rights of their users? So. Um, we, um, we began to research this uh, question because we wondered, was this an isolated case or not? And we quickly determined that, in fact, it was not, that there was a broader pattern of um, 10 cases over about three years. We worked with a number of Russian NGOs. We have a pretty broad network there. We, our organization has been there for many years. And um, we also learned that some of these cases directly implicated Microsoft's agents on the ground in Russia. Um, it was also clear that the timing and the targets of these cases weren't random or um, the, the result of any rogue officials. There was real purpose behind it. And you may think that you know 10 cases doesn't sound like that many, but in fact, the impact on civil society was enormous because five of these cases took out independent news uh, organizations. Another case took out the leading environmental organization in the country. And then another of several took out election observer groups on the brink of monitoring elections and anti-hate speech groups, all of them before key events that had been planned. So it was clearly a campaign to stifle uh, dissent in the country. So we took that information to Microsoft, shared that information with them, and then helped them with their own investigation. And we made a number of recommendations to them, but the core recommendation really was, you've got to remove the incentive for the Russian authorities to use this as a tool against civil society members. We recognize that Microsoft had a very legitimate uh, reason to promote IP enforcement in Russia. IP piracy is rampant. But uh, Microsoft recognized, as well as we did, that these cases were an abuse of that authority and really were eroding their ability to uh, promote um, appropriate enforcement. None of these groups uh, were in any way <laughs> involved in trafficking or, um, or piracy of, of um, software on a broad scale. That was not really uh, the object of this enforcement. So um, Microsoft uh, took our information, um, announced a plan in response, um, which included um, plans to develop a temporary license, which really responded to our core concern, remove the incentive. We thought that that was a really novel approach, but that it would also benefit from some input from the groups that had been targeted, because Russia is a really challenging environment. So with tremendous help from the US State Department, we brought many of the individuals who'd been targeted by these cases to the US. They were across nine time zones. None of them had ever been to the US before. So that was really amazing, because we did it on a short time frame. The Microsoft executives flew to New York to our offices, and we sat down there to really talk about the license plan and some of the key concerns of these groups. So one was, you know, how do you design a license to cover potential targets? It's got to be pretty broad. Um, and how do you make sure that um, both NGOs and also Russian officials are aware of the program? Because part of it is you just want to fend off and ideally anticipate and prevent these cases. And then also, what could Microsoft do to clarify within the country who is authorized to represent it in court, which would also remove an additional layer or potential for abuse? And then um, finally, and, and most importantly, we thought that it was really important that people at the headquarters level out in Seattle remain engaged, because there was clearly some disconnects within the country about the problem and its origins and what to do. And, and we were gratified that headquarters did see an important role and also um, established at, at our recommendation a hotline so that if there was an urgent case developing, there would be a fairly immediate way to notify people and get a response. Um, we also, after, um, after this meeting, um, Microsoft tweaked its license uh, program. And I think this input they felt was extremely valuable in two respects, because it did really change the way they approached the license uh, program. But it also started to develop a foundation of trust uh, and a relationship uh, building at a different level than had been possible before, which was needed as this program rolled out. We then suggested that when Microsoft launched the program that we go together to Moscow, convene a group of NGOs, talk through the program, get them on board, make sure they understood it, and then also meet with the US Embassy to help them understand what we were trying to do and integrate it into their own outreach and IP enforcement efforts, which they have been doing. Um, I'm really happy to report that I think 
we all consider, even the Russians who are extremely, they were extremely cynical about this, as you could expect, given the history of government treatment of NGOs. Um, the, the cases haven't stopped, but what's um, important is that um, there aren't as many and the response is pretty rapid. What happens in all of these cases is the officials come in, they close down the office, they take away all the equipment and all the records. And so it pretty much puts any organization out of business. That's not happening anymore. And I think NGOs feel greatly empowered by this. It doesn't mean that the authorities may not look at other ways to um, use laws in an abusive fashion, but what it does mean is Microsoft's not a part of that. In fact, they're part of a solution and part of a dialogue. And so in that respect, I think we've all felt uh, pretty gratified by that. And um, Microsoft is now working on a permanent solution which would involve um, free software uh, donation. And so there would be some challenges with that, but the idea is to take the lessons that we learned here and then roll them out in a more permanent way. This program was not confined to Russia. The, the company did announce a program that would cover 13 countries because there were some issues uh, in Kyrgyzstan and other countries. So it's really, we thought, a pretty innovative um, uh, approach. Um, and I think it illustrates just the importance for all uh, companies of taking a lot of the steps that GNI prescribes, of having some sense when you're operating in repressive governments of where the risks are coming from, making sure your local people are well trained, there are escalation procedures, and there are folks at headquarters paying attention and, and giving those people either a playbook or an out to call back to headquarters or to a regional level to address the problem. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Four really, really interesting um, case studies about um, the activities of companies, governments, and NGO input um, with a direct set of quantifiable results or in Emily's case with the, the UK's new legislation, what we uh, hope will be through concerted effort at least some form of mitigating um, uh, ac um, activity. Um, as ever, Danny O'Brien helpfully tweets um, that if you want to follow um, more discussion about the UK's new communications law, um, the hashtag is CCDP, um, which uh, will give you more information which um, we'll discuss. I'd just like to ask all four um, panelists, um, or any of you, and, and Emily, if you want to come in, just, just wave your hand, I think it's the best thing. Um, uh, the, the fact of GNI, the, the fact of this uh, multi-stakeholder um, organization, um, how has that influenced the way your organizations have worked? Or conversely, how have these examples and other work that you do influenced the work um, of of GNI, the, this kind of shared learning, the fact that um, from time to time you're sitting in rooms with um, companies uh, very large and some and some smaller, the fact that um, you're talking to different types of people around the world in in different sectors. How does that in influence your your work? Who'd like to um, uh, begin on that? Uh, I can go, go on, Mike. Yeah. Um, so. You know, our membership in GNI hasn't really changed how we do things internally because um, we had already been abiding by our own policies, which were consistent with the GNI principles. Um, but I think it has changed how, you know, we interact and how I interact uh, with others because um, people view our membership as, as with GNI as as being action, whereas before. Uh, they felt, uh, frequently I felt like folks interpreted what I said as words, but you know, you're saying all the right things, but you, you probably don't stand behind them. So I do think when, uh, when I talk about these subjects and our membership with GNI, I do think it encourages um, others to think more seriously about it, whether it's within our industry or outside of our industry. Um, and not sure why that is, quite frankly, uh, because we haven't actually changed our policies, but I think it speaks well to, to GNI's reputation. And I think when I speak about being a member of GNI, it drives people to look at the website or whatnot and see who's involved, see what other companies are involved, and, and, and see that um, you know, there's, there's real movement afoot. And, and to the others, has, has it helped you in any way in the way you deal with companies? Because obviously they have they're of a completely different size, they have different agendas, different self-interests, and knowing how to navigate your way around. But from our perspective, I think, as I mentioned, I mean, 
it has changed our behavior in that, in a sense that we can use the, the principles, we can use the guidelines, and they are very useful. Um, but also, I think the experience of working in a multi-stakeholder initiative is really useful. We've seen it in other industries with great effects. Um, but to have that experience and also to see how you maybe in the future can build trust with, with the larger group of companies within the sector, uh, I think that is key in order to advance these issues. Um, other ways, uh, otherwise, um, I mean, just to be able also to tap into all the knowledge and all the experiences of, of such a big group and such a diverse group is, is of course, extremely useful. Um, so those are a few of the benefits that we've seen so far. Meg, do you want to come? Sure. So I think um, there are a couple of sort of obvious uh, benefits from uh, GNI. Our organization has uh, been involved in these types of collaborations for almost 20 years. We began with the Fair Labor Association. We're part of the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, and we're currently elaborating a framework for private security providers. So this strategy is one that we really believe is quite effective in working with companies, both because uh, it helps uh, it, in a common issue framing and common understanding of the problem, and then also an agreed upon set of principles in which to um, think about solutions to the problem. I think one of the big takeaways uh, is that you know companies can't go it alone in repressive environments. And uh, what uh, the GNI and multi-stakeholder initiatives like it do is enable us to talk to one another in a place that's respectful, trusted, and shared, and bring to bear our, our various areas of expertise. Companies, uh, in this case, uh, Microsoft had relationships in Russia, but to some extent didn't have the same networks of human rights groups that we did. So we could bring that expertise to bear and tap those networks to really delineate the scope of the problem and break through some of the misperceptions that the company may have been getting from its own representatives in the country, which I think was really, really uh, important. And also that uh, they were able to explain to us some of the challenges that they would have in implementing this kind of program, and we could work together to try to work through something that would work for both for both sides. And, and the GNI framework, as I mentioned, was really important in thinking through, you know, from the standpoint of how does a company operate in an environment where the laws may tell you one thing, but um, in fact, the result is quite opposite. In other words, in this case, the abuse of a, a legitimate law for an illegitimate purpose, and how does a company potentially extricate itself from that? What are the ways one can think about that challenge and work through that? So the GNI, I think, gave us a framework and a set of principles and tactics to try to work through that solution. Um, Emily in London, um, any um, thoughts about how GNI can help index, uh, can work with index and other organizations in uh, tackling in, and in, uh, uh, in your advocacy work with regard uh, specifically to this new proposed law in the UK? Well, I think this bill, it's going to be incredibly important yeah. to get international pressure, not just UK pressure on the government. Yeah. I mean, this is a new norm for, for Western democracies. We know what happens when countries like the UK introduce this kind of legislation, it quickly spreads throughout the rest of the world. Um, so I think it's going to be enormously helpful to get uh, foreign uh, corporations and foreign NGOs involved in the fight against the legislation. And for us, that's, that's the use of GNI. It's um, drawing attention to these kind of issues. Uh, so making sure a local agenda has an international following. Um, Emily, can you hear me? Emily, can you hear me? It's gone. Right. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll come. I'll come back to it. Right. It, um, we have one. Um, uh, we have a question on Twitter. Can Sarah Nordbrand et al. comment on the telco dialogue and its human rights draft principles, please? Telia Sonera is part of it. Yes. Uh, I know. I, I. I don't have any updated information. Uh, as I think you're aware of, they circulated a draft of principles. Um, about a month ago, and I know that there was a follow-up meeting last week uh, to discuss uh, comments from, from different stakeholders, including the GNI, but I, I don't have any information about next steps or, or what will be, um, yeah, how they will make use of the GNI comments, for instance. Um, so hopefully we'll, we will hear from them soon. Um, I know that they say that they are searching for a home, 
um, if that would be GNI or, or some other fora, uh, we don't know. Um, I just hope that you know it won't be a GNI light. Um, that they will really, um, yeah, focus on the core strength that that the GNI is actually providing and and all the substantial work that has already been been done uh, that they could actually just tap into if they join. Right. I think we'll throw. It, uh, yeah, Meg, and then we'll throw it. Yeah. So I think you know one thing that struck us in looking at the principles is you know. Anyone can go out and kind of cobble together a set of principles, and I know they took a lot of time, they were thoughtful about it, but what's missing is the multi-stakeholder piece. And um, I think the telcos are painfully aware that they do have some really serious issues. They keep finding themselves on the front page, they don't like it, they don't want to be there. And we know that a multi-stakeholder approach to these problems works. You've heard some examples here. It doesn't mean that companies won't still have issues and problems and sometimes find themselves on the front page, but it does give them the opportunity to work with other stakeholders in a framework that sets forth some rules and shared principles to find a common solution that is both you know, business appropriate and rights respecting. And I think that's the missing piece in their effort and hopefully they will hear and understand the value that a group like the GNI can bring to their efforts to ground it in a credible, um, independent, and 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 rigorous uh, and, and serious initiative. I think that's the that's the missing piece in in the initiative that they have, and um, that's what would distinguish uh, their effort from you know a normal trade association endeavor, uh, which is which is completely siloed within industry. Right. I think it's time to take questions and observations. Do we have the microphone ready? Um, uh, on, the, on this, on that specific question, and and on um, others, Bennett, do you, you want to go yeah, sure. first? I, I just want to pick up on um, Sarah and Meg's response to your question, John, about the telcos. Look, GNI does not have to be the be-all and end-all for every ICT sector company trying to grapple with these tough issues. And the telcos have every right, in my opinion, to experiment with a distinct and different approach. That said, uh, I really believe that any approach to dealing with Internet freedom in the ICT sector, particularly dealing with uh, right to privacy and freedom of expression issues, must meet three essential tests. The first is operational utility practical impact, specific impact on the ground or in the cloud, however one wants to put it metaphorically. And that is what GNI has. Second, multi-stakeholder credibility. And Sarah underlined, as did Meg, the combination um, of not just companies but NGOs, academic experts, and investors. Uh, and then third, beyond those first two, is public accountability. Uh, and Meg made reference to other multi-stakeholder initiatives that Human Rights First has been involved with over the years, the lion's share really of the front line ones. There are a couple of others, but uh, I just don't see how in the second decade of the 21st century uh, you can have a, an approach to business and human rights in this or any other sector that doesn't have a rigorous approach to public accountability. So I think that the, the telcos, you know, great, you know, circulate the draft, but I would note that while their draft has some degree of potential operational utility, it at this time is not combined with the structure that would lend either multi-stakeholder credibility or public accountability. And for, I can say on behalf of Calvert, and I'm sure that uh, our colleagues among investors in the human rights NGOs, whether in or outside the GNI process, would not disagree, we would be inclined to dismiss such an approach that did not meet those tests. Uh, I do hope, though, that uh, the telcos will see the merit of uh, coming up with an approach that does incorporate those elements. The door from GNI is open to engaging with them, uh, and our implementation guidelines, while reflecting to some extent the interests of 
internet content providers, Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft there from the beginning were never intended to address exclusively that segment of the ICT uh, industry. And there is every potential for GNI to work with this, this group of telecommunications companies to adapt, enlarge, expand the implementation guidelines to deal with their overlapping, but in some ways distinct or different uh, challenges and the tough places where they operate. Thank you. Um, <coughs> right. Uh, at, at the back, please. Back row, and then we'll work our way forward. Uh, Leslie Harris, Center for Democracy and Technology. So I just wanted to add. Can you um, speak the mic closer? It's pretty close. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add uh, one thing to this discussion, and I think that it is hard to see um, the value of the internal dialogue from the outside. And so I think it's something that the telecoms are missing a bit. Uh, not just that it is multi-stakeholder, but sort of the richness of that dialogue and the, the exchange of um, frameworks for viewing this issue. Uh, and, and I think one of the, you know, while I, while I agree that, in, in, in fact, I think we ought to sort of own and take pride in the fact that now others believe they need to um, move into this space, um, that the ability cross industry sectors to talk in an environment that's not competitive, where they put the competitive concerns aside, uh, is a value added that I know from CDT on our own way of working in our working groups, uh, that I think setting up another initiative um, will be both lost to GNI, i.e. the benefit of really understanding the concerns of telecom, they, I think, will, uh, will be poorer as well in terms of, you know, ultimately what an initiative can achieve. So, you know, I think, I'm hoping that's something that, that they will take into account uh, in, in thinking through where they're going to go. Thank you. Um, in addition, I'd, I'd like to um, invite questions relating to a, any of these um, country uh, um, specifics or any other country specifics you'd like to draw our attention to. Lady there. And, um. Hi, I'm Shelley Hahn with the Helsinki Commission. And I wanted to ask Michael if you could talk about the economic impact of your business decisions um, and how, how that plays into why WebSense decided to make those decisions early on and, and then how it impacts your business today and perhaps maybe draw some lessons for other companies. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So, you know, that question came up for the earlier panel as well and, and I obviously get that, that question a lot and, you know, as uh, a CFO of the company, obviously my focus is the bottom line and, and our shareholders' concern is uh, increasing shareholder value. And um, I think that, you know, the, the, if I was going to be cynical about it, I would say, you know, ethics are great, but my job is to deliver profits. And, and those two, you know, are incongruous. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that's the case. I think that the, the, the reality is, is that people who think that way are looking very short term. And they're looking at something like, you know, this Pakistani opportunity as that's $2 million that I could have this quarter that I'm not going to have because they can put their finger on it. I think. Um, there is lots of economic benefit to being a good behavior, uh, showing good behavior in this area. I think it's just, it's harder to put your finger on it and quantify it because one of the subjects that was raised earlier was reputational. And I think, you know, uh, reputational benefits and branding benefits um, have both a long-term and a short-term impact. I think um, if you think over the longer term, being a, a more positively viewed brand is going to have a bigger impact in different in other bidding environments. And even in the short plan, in the short term, you know, I, I choose to believe that um, we are winning business in other areas that maybe we can't put our finger on so specifically because no customer tells us that they chose our product primarily because we're a member of the GNI and this is what we do and this is the stand we take. They tell us, you know, it's based on price, features, you know, all those sorts of things because those are how they're supposed to be choosing products. 
but they may look at us more favorably or all things being equal choose us. So the fact that because of this involvement in our stance, so the fact that they aren't um, telling us that's why they're buying our product, it doesn't mean that they're not. And then I think the, the another more difficult to quantify area is the employee impact that it has and a morale impact on an organization. I think in terms of recruiting talent, um, top talent that has um, op choices, options to go anywhere, they tend to want to go to organizations that they can feel good being a part of and working for. And they tend to stay away from organizations that they don't. And um, if you asked, you know, if you told, you know, executives and they believed you that, uh, you know, if you take a, a poor, uh, a socially unconscious stance on some, in some area, um, that you are going to lose two of your top 20 employees. Not two of your top 20 executives, just whoever your top 20 employees are around the world, you're going to lose two of them because they don't feel good about working here. Um, I think they would recognize that's a big loss. Um, the problem is, is that they don't know who those people are. They leave and that's not why they say they leave and they can't put their finger on it. We were, we were talking about this earlier and um, you know, one of the things I, I, I noticed is you know, when we do publicly pass on a bid or an opportunity or, or do something where we're bypassing short-term economic gain, um, I'll receive maybe like 12 to 24, a dozen, two dozen emails from employees saying, you know what, I saw that we did that, that's really great. And I figure that, you know, if I've got employees who are willing to send an email to the CFO saying that, there's probably 20 times the number of employees who feel that way but aren't really willing to send an email to me. Um, I'm very intimidating, you know. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, I think there is a lot of economic benefit. And, and, and it's just not as discreet as, but you just passed up on that opportunity. But Mike, at the risk, but I think it's bigger. At the risk of being skeptical, um, if that logic was so incontrovertible, why, and particularly about mm -hmm. employee um, motivation, um, why do mobile phone, uh, mobile operators and others, uh, certain ISPs, whatever, uh, cooperate with uh, unsavory regimes in the way they do if the, the kickback, be it internal or reputational damage, was so clear cut? I, I think, you know, there's two reasons for that. Um, you know, one is, and this came up with the earlier panel as well, everything I refer to as benefits are not measurable. So you've got a measurable, tangible on one side and something that can't be measured, quantified on the other side. And, you know, the other reason is that uh, people are prone to short-term thinking. And the safe thing to do or the conservative thing to do is to make sure I get that business and I don't have to explain why I didn't. It's a lot more difficult to explain why I didn't than why I did. Um, I'd just like to bring in Emily here in, in London. Emily, Index um, has been campaigning uh, consistently now and successfully um, with regard to Belarus and um, censorship there and the uh, collusion, uh, for want of a better term, of certain Western companies, uh, PR firms, all kinds of organizations um, with that government. What is your take on the extent to which lobbying and advocacy can name and shame and the effectiveness of that naming and shaming? Well, it's certainly in our lab reform. Hello? We can hear you. Oops. <laughs> right, we'll have to come back. Um, Bob, and then gentleman here, and then lady there. Yeah, fine. Hi. Um, just want to add one more factor for telcos here, and that is their origin. I mean, I think that people have to remember that the difference between telcos and other companies is that most of them were nationalized. They were national companies. It's not called British Telecom or Deutsche Telekom uh, for nothing. Uh, and therefore, they have a completely different attitude and are born of a different sort of thinking than are internet companies per se or hardware companies. And that is when a national government says, do this, uh, jump, you know, jump here, they say, how high? Uh, they don't say why. And that's an extraordinarily important thing for us to remember, I think, as we consider their actions 
uh, and why they might not be eager to join in the fun, uh, and also why they might not be eager to adopt uh, standards and guidelines that work for different kinds of companies from them. Thank you. Um, gentleman here, and then lady there. Yep. No, no, behind you. Thank you. Stand back here so people can everyone see me. I'm creating the next. So my name is David Chom. I'm just here as an individual, and uh, I'm delighted to see all this uh, effort in trying to uh, make the world a better place. I wanted to just point out a, just uh, one scientific fact and and just uh, an organizational suggestion. And and uh, you know, I can't remember how many times I've seen people stand up in meetings like this and make comments like this. And I know many people won't like it, but I just feel like I. I should probably do it. Um, so uh, doing it for the, for the common good, maybe there's something great that could come from it. It may seem f foreign. But the fact is this, that um, with today's technology, it is an indisputable fact that routers could uh, actually be uh, Tor nodes in effect. Um, and I say this with some authority because I'm the guy who invented the protocol that Tor uses, uh, even though you know you don't see my name attributed as much as it should have been. but. That's another matter, but you can just go back and look at literature and it's overwhelmingly clear. Um, and these issues of traffic analysis that we heard about and so on. I'll, I'll make if a, you could I'll just pinpoint your, your I'm your sure I'll pinpoint Thanks, my question we've got a lot in just of people a moment. To get through. Yeah, I, Thank you. I just want to make the background. So that's the background statement. Okay? And I hope that's so that it's technologically feasible to solve all these problems of traffic analysis and protect all traffic on every link at essentially no additional cost nowadays. Encryption has become so inexpensive, uh, and routers are very capable pieces of equipment. So that's a, that's a choice that we could make. Um, and so my, my policy uh, and question for this group, and uh, uh, suggestion really, is just this, that I guess that if there was, let's say, a honorary seat at the table uh, of these multilateral discussions, which I think multi-stakeholder discussions are very, you know, good, uh, for some kind of people that aren't, can't pay and, and are representing maybe, you know, technologists or, I don't know, the hacker community or open source world or what have you, uh, they might, that seat might be able to provide a, a really interesting perspective and, uh, you know, in the end, it might be something that helps the business interests uh, that makes this uh, multi-stakeholder activity uh, even more of an interesting model that engenders other kinds of uh, positive things to happen in the world. And it also might kind of, you know, as a, as a friend of mine says, to sort of shoot the problem dead uh, as opposed to having to kind of always keep put, you know, to me it was, in incredibly ironic to hear that we're having this, you're having this meeting here today, I'm not really a member, uh, and that England just said that they were going to be doing stuff that's probably worse than, than most of these countries could afford to do anyways, because they were going to save every single record. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's astoundingly uh, intrusive. So um, anyway, so that's, that's my, my po uh, the fact is this problem could all be ver solved for free if people got organized to do that. And secondly, my suggestion is try to give a public uh, participant to, to your, uh, your force so that you could possibly consider these sort of alternatives. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Lady here, and then I just want to go to Emily and then I'll Hi, I'm Jane Larson from International Media Support in Denmark. Uh, I'm very curious to what you raised, Mech, and uh, I would like to de-technify this conversation a bit, uh, putting it down to the level of what what is the usefulness of, of, of getting the activists or the non-state media to meet with some of the company representatives. Uh, most of our partners in the former Soviet Union were actually in that film from the Telia Sonera investigation, and it was really, really evident, you know, how the technologies work. A big question there is then, what can Telia Sonera actually do to, to, to avoid uh, having these rooms and black boxes installed locally where they go in? Uh, that's a big question, and I don't have a clear answer to that. But coming back to you, Meg, 
the usefulness of bringing Microsoft guys together with the local activists. Uh, I feel that there is simply a complete lack of, of, of knowledge and, and even imagination to, to, to basically understand what these local guys are going through. Uh, they are being uh, surveyed, they are being threatened, they have phone calls at night, people come to their houses, they threaten their kids, etc., etc. And all this is backed up by the use of, of, of technologies, you know, basically surveying their movements and actions and, and communications, etc. So I think the whole issue of bringing uh, local activists and, 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 and uh, human rights activists together with the companies to, to make this uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, possible, I think that is uh, something that would probably uh, benefit uh, uh, the knowledge uh, of, of people in the West and the rest. And just to say, Emily, we haven't forgotten about you, so uh, we're just going to take a, a answer this round of, of questions and observations uh, and then just want to come back to this point of the effectiveness of, of advocacy with reference to Belarus, yes. Azerbaijan, and, and elsewhere. Uh, Meg, sorry, do you, would you, do you want to ad uh, address any of those? I just agree. I mean, to get um, those kind of interaction and those kind of meetings in place, I think that is, is key. Um, it's not as easy <laughs> to, to do it in practice, may, maybe uh, locally, but yeah, you mentioned you flew over a few people and, and also, um, of course, you can I interact with representatives of certain groups that cannot meet locally and so on. But I think that is really key that companies don't only uh, consult and dialogue with, with uh, <coughs> the most evident stakeholders far away, um, but really to have local consultations as well. I think in this case there were two sort of major benefits from that was that the obviously the folks on the ground were seeing this in a very blinkered fashion because you know everything told them look we've got a law enforcement request we've got to go in and, and do this and even at the level of headquarters in Moscow it was a little difficult to try to square what was happening in the country with what how that was being perceived outside the country and so bringing the activists together with senior officials outside that environment to hear that evidence and hear from these people, we were in this trial, this is what happened, and this is how this charge got elevated to a criminal charge was because this was basically legitimized by the participation of your reps or because uh, particular valuations were assigned that made this a criminal case or other aspects of that, just the ways in which these proceedings play out, but also informing the design of the remedy because, um, again, you know, one challenge there was that the lo if you use local laws to try to qualify people, you'd exclude most of the victims. So how do you um, come up with something that's flexible, doesn't fly in the face of local regimes, but is acceptable uh, and can be useful to victims and give victims enough of a measure of trust in your intent to participate and to exercise uh, that authority, the authority that the company is extending. So I think you're absolutely right. It also broke down some barriers because they did have some relationships, but not as wide or as deep. And uh, those conversations continue, and I think it made a, a real difference in terms of their overall uh, view of um, civil society there and, and some more long-term interactions, which have been very good. And I give Microsoft a great degree of credit for the amount of attention that they've given at the highest levels and their commitment to seeing this through uh, in a very effective way. Uh, they continue to monitor this. We have regular conversations with civil society and with, with the officials involved, so their commitment has continued at that level. Thank you. Um, Emily, could, could you just come back in, um, if you can uh, hear us, um, uh, and we'll give it one more go, on the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, advocacy work with regard to Belarus, Azerbaijan? I think what's been really crucial there is, is some of the elements people have just mentioned about getting local activists in front of people from major corporations, especially in our work in Belarus. Uh, what proved crucial was to get local activists in meetings with banks like RBS, who then pulled out of selling Belarusian bonds. When yeah. they stopped taking part in capital raising, it put pressure on the government and it was an aid to some of the activists we work with. Yeah, just to, um, to amplify that remark, it w there was one remarkable success, which was stopping three major Western European banks from 
uh, purchasing bonds. And that was a, a really interesting, uh, this was from the Belarus government, this was a really interesting and very specific um, success in, in terms of advocacy, which was uh, an element of, goes back to this issue of reputational benefit or disbenefit from uh, collaboration. It was in a different sector, it wasn't obviously in the ICT in this respect, um, but it was, a, it was a useful example. Susan, you wanted to, Mike, Mike thanks. I actually wanted to ask Emily a question, so I'm hoping that the uh, the line holds up. Um, it was a couple of a couple of things. I know that the uh, the uh, comms data bill that was published today in the UK. I know that been it was announced in the Queen's speech. There'd been a lot of media coverage um, over the last month or so, and I just wondered if um, you could say a little bit about your sort of initial reaction on whether you think any of the pressure and the scepticism that's been um, evident in the UK prior to the bill being published has had any impact on the bill that's actually being put out today or whether it's largely um, what it looked as though it would be a month, a month or so ago. And then I think secondly, it would be great just to hear um, from you just some ideas on where you think there would be an opportunity to intervene between now and oh, say over the next six months as it, as it progresses through its consultation phase. Thanks. Well, well, so far, the public pressure hasn't had an impact because we've seen very minimal changes between what was moved in the fall to what has come to pass. Uh, the only element that's really been substantially changed that we've been thrown a bone on is that local authorities, so that's local councils, other people who are responsible for your bins, etc., won't have information to this data and will no longer have information to your phone records. Other than that, it remains fairly intact. This has forced the government to give this bill additional scrutiny, you know, allow public additional scrutiny. So the bill goes to an extra committee. It was taken out of a much broader bill that in all likelihood would have sailed past government. So there's an, there is an additional element of examination, but a huge amount of detail missing at this point. Um, and I think it's going to take a great deal of time before we get you know, we get the information we need about this draft. Uh, in terms of uh, what we can do to intervene, I think it's quite important that we start to model the MPs now. It's going to be incredibly important with the uh, some of the uh, providers that are going to be targeted, who are going to be forced to store this information, uh, start to uh, work out a way to to make clear their opposition. Uh, they certainly are internet providers. Association has been very clear in their opposition. But to to tie together NGOs and the business community. I think it will be essential in order to put the, the level of pressure that is going to be required to force this government to U-turn. And then just two quick observations. Patrick, from Yahoo, do you want to come in at all on this? I mean, just a couple of quick observations from me. I mean, a, a, a standard tactic of, of governments, plural, um, and certainly this particular government that uh, uh, has uh, been pursued since time immemorial is to publish a draft bill that is so egregiously extreme, that you then have this negotiation and it's almost a sort of face-saving thing, then compromises are made, uh, NGOs and uh, um, lobbyists and whatever feel pleased at the progress that has been made, but the final, st the final bill, albeit improved, is still a bad bill. Um, but that is a sort of standard, standard procedure um, to push the boat out. And on this specific bill, I mean, it's... It, the, the suspicion is that it will be seen as a template for other governments. So uh, the activity that GNI um, uh, may wish to undertake on this will be really important. Uh, it goes far beyond uh, the jurisdiction of one country because um, it will, uh, the legislation will be seen as, as a bit of a template. That's just a comment. Patrick. Um, I'm Patrick Robinson from, from uh, Yahoo Public Policy in the UK. Um, I would absolutely agree with, with what Emily's just said about the, the central victory of the lobby so far has been getting added scrutiny to this bill. Uh, as she suggests, it really was going to be kind of snuck into something else that, that probably would not have got the level of scrutiny that it, it is going to get because of the activities of both businesses and NGOs 
and certain politicians in raising this as an issue. Um, I, I certainly hope that John is right and that we're going to end up with a negotiation that, that limits some of the more egregious aspects of the bill. I think the role that the GNI can play here is really, I think it's very uncomfortable for Western governments to suddenly find themselves um, uh, uh, bracketed with Belarus, Thailand, um, you know, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, when it comes to these kinds of issues. And we find, and I find, that uh, British politicians get very anxious when they stand up in international fora and are praised by the likes of the Chinese for, you know, <laughs> introducing a civilizing aspect to the internet. So I think there is definitely a presentational aspect here that says that if the GNI is intervening to protect human rights and freedom of expression in the United Kingdom, there is something very strange going on. We've got time for a couple more questions or observations before we move into the third plenary. Yes, of course. My name's Fariha. Um, I'm from Pakistan. I represent an organization called Bolo B, which focuses on research and advocacy. I'd like to um, add to what Mike spoke about um, the national filtration software that the Pakistan government um, advertised for and um, companies are going to bid for it. Now, what GNI and uh, WebSense, their involvement uh, did was, uh, GNI helped us connect to a lot of people, uh, a lot of companies who would potentially bid for something like this and provide the software uh, to the Pakistan government. And WebSense was the first company to say that they would not bid for something like this. So they were the first company to take a stand. That set the ball rolling because then companies like Cisco um, and many others went ahead and said, we will also not bid for it. Um, so the kind of the public um, uproar about this and the kind of strong statements that came in from credible, uh, reputable companies such as WebSense and then Cisco, it it really made a difference. Uh, simultaneously, the president of the Pakistan Software Houses Association was speaking to government officials. And what eventually happened is that um, the deadline for um, the bid, it was delayed. And the government was, uh, they delayed their deadline um, when the company they would shut the bid and make a final decision. And what this has done is it's sort of gone into the background now. We don't know what's happening on the back end, whether they're still working on it, but what they said is that they've shelved it for now. And that really came about because of the public pressure that was created by all of these companies. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, yeah, very, very. Do you want to, Mike, do you want to add to any of that with regard to Pakistan? Um, no, I mean, I, I do, you know, I do fear that, uh, um, somebody will end up obviously providing uh, the service uh, as they do, and, and hopefully as it fades into the background, we, we can sort of keep that from happening um, and, and have them engage with somebody through the back door after the public pressure period has ended. Time for one, possibly two final uh, interventions or thoughts, or we can just elide effortlessly. Yep. Hi, this is uh, Dunstan Allison Hope from BSR. And this is perhaps a thought for the next panel as much as this one. Uh, I've enjoyed the, the case study approach and hearing about examples that have happened uh, so far, but of course they're all in the past. And I'm wondering if there's value in more of a sort of scenario planning approach where we start to think about things that might happen in the future. Because I've found these case studies very illustrative, but what's happening next? You know, what should, be worried, what should we be worried about in two or three years time? So I'm wondering, perhaps that's a question for the next panel about how the GNI you know, intervenes in upcoming uh, events, incidents, event, uh, things that are going to happen uh, over the coming years. That was very helpful because my note for the third qu uh, session is where do we go from here? So um, <laughs> that is absolutely uh, perfect. But any quick observations from any of the four panelists about the next big challenges before we ask that of the final panel? My view is that uh, uh, I think that I know the work's underway to get more companies involved because I think that as is 
fairly common with movements of this nature and organizations of this nature. While there were three founding companies members, um, it's been very difficult to get more and to get a broader set of, of company members, uh, you know, big companies, small companies, um, point companies, and, and then broad-based companies. And, you know, I think that's where this needs to go next. And I know um, the GNI has initiated an observer status program, which hopefully will help, because I think that just getting, I think getting more corporate, direct corporate involvement, I think, you know, getting that started, you know, one wave begets the next wave and then the next one. And, and I think that's how ultimately, you know, we'd all like, and this was a subject from earlier, I mean, we'd all like governments to change, but governments change very slowly. Um, I think that uh, getting more corporate involvement, um, you know, will, will lend itself not only in the subjects that we're specifically talking about today, but as technology and the internet and whatnot rapidly changes over the next couple of years into um, unimaginable um, new ways, um, I think having more companies involved uh, will be helpful. Uh, Emily, very briefly, any um, sort of future thoughts uh, n identify the next challenges? Well, I, mean, I think the, the next challenge for the UK-based uh, organizations is pretty clear right now. Um, in terms of international challenges, we, we are seeing a huge challenge to of religious and cultural censorship obviously arising in uh, you know, what's following the Arab Spring. So certainly to artists and, and local activists, I think that's going to be really interesting to watch in the next 12 months. Thank you. Um, Meg? So um, I agree with Mike. I would just add two things. I think that what we need to do is uh, take these types of cases and lessons and extract from them at least some preliminary notions about what best practices look like. And that could be both in areas like human rights impact assessment or essentially what due diligence looks like. And then also, with respect to our example, uh, effective stakeholder engagement, how that can better be structured to maximize the potential picking up on what um, some of our commentators have said, because that's an area where we in the NGO community, I think, can play a greater role. So, sorry, any final no, I also thoughts? think that we need more best practice, but also maybe more discussions around how companies and 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 um, uh, diplomats can complement each other within this space. Also, to make sure that companies are not taking over the role of states and the obligations of the states. Um, so, I think, yeah, this great is a discussion. We need. Well. Th Thank you to our four panelists. We're now going to move directly from the second panel to the third. So if I could thank uh, Emily via um, video link, um, Mike Newman, uh, Sarah Norbrand, and Meg Rogensack.